These are the different levels of prevention. At the very base is um, perimortal prevention, which basically targets social and economic policies. Policies are key. Policies such as no smoking, um, banning, um, putting warning labels on cigarettes, um, banning uh, certain items to be in, in certain areas, taking out lead of gasoline so we do not have lead poisoning or, or requiring water treatment facilities to post um, the results of the water quality so that the community can see. And this is perimortal prevention and it is key because it really sets the foundation for everything. Next level is primary prevention and primary prevention really targets the risk factors leading to injury and disease. So um, safe, safe belt, uh, safety belt laws, right? Um, vaccinations. I mean, yes, you could still get injured in a car vehicle crash with a, when you're using your safety uh, seat belt, but it prevents you from getting m more serious injuries. And yes, you could still get a disease even after you've been vaccinated, but the, the risk of you getting a disease significantly drops. Um, from being a hundred percent to maybe only five percent chance and that's primary prevention other examples could be um, you know brushing your teeth um, putting fluoride into our into your dental um, into your toothpaste and or in your water again primary prevention prevents you from getting cavities secondary prevention is different than primary prevention because secondary prevention is basically catching a disease before it spreads. Examples of this um, are screenings. Um, when you go to the dentist and he finds a carry and they put a filling in there and they're preventing your tooth from completely falling apart or um, you catch um, cancer before it spreads. And tertiary, it really focuses on rehabbing a person with injury and disease and reduces complications. So do you see how that's a different, in a sense, it's reducing complications. Here's some examples of really drive, dil, drilling down a little bit more. Primary prevention, how you can make this happen, is knowledge of your family cancer. So knowing at an individual level that you've had cancer in your family helps your doctor um, provide um, techniques and strategies to prevent um, hopefully prevent cancer before it occurs. History of disease, adequate and healthy food, the food that you eat and consume can make a direct impact on whether you probably could put yourself more at risk for cancer. And then good opportunities for health. You walking every day, um, your mental health, all these are primary prevention. And um, being aware of that is key. This is all on an individual level, primary prevention. Secondary prevention is different because it really looks at screening. And so you get tests to screen. So let's say um, an example of this would be tuberculosis screening. So you test negative, great, you don't have TB. But if you test positive for TB, then they're going to do items to really prevent the disease from spreading or controlling it or um, along those lines. Um, mammograms are another example of secondary prevention. Again, if someone tests negative, great, come back in six months, we'll continue to screen, and our goal is to catch this before it spreads to make it, uh, catch it preclinical. So mammograms uh, are an ex ex excellent example of secondary prevention. Prostate cancer screenings. Um, think about screenings in general. They're catching the disease before it spreads or trying to get in there and do treatments. Tertiary prevention is, like I said, rehabbing and getting you back to your functioning self. So your emergency response system is a tertiary prevention. How fast an ambulance gets to you is key. Um, whether you have a hospital close by is key. The emergency room that admits you is key. The treatment of the doctor, how that doctor comes in and treats you is key. So 
Church emergency response systems are often partnered with the in the health department because the health department it they consider that definitely a key public health system. Our emergency response system is part of our public health system. And then of course the medicines that are prescribed for an individual can definitely be tertiary prevention. So tertiary prevention is getting you back to rehabbing you and getting you back to being functional. With that in mind, can you kind of picture now how the socio-ecological model can definitely impact someone's ability to do primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention? Someone's individual knowledge, their social networks, the environment, the community that they live in, and the public policies all impact their social, uh, what we call the social determinants of health, impact their primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. And these social determinants of health are economic stability. Think about the community that you live in. If is it, are people at work? Do you have great grocery stores nearby you? Do you have um, access to things? Um, are you employed? Do you can you get a job? Can you um, find some place that is accessible for you to rent um, and that you can afford? Social content, community, and context. Yes, whether people are happy and well around you does impact your health. Um, your neighborhood and environment, do you feel like you can talk to your neighbors? Do you think you can walk in your environment? Do you feel safe walking on your streets and not being hit by a car? How about your health care? Do you have a primary care home? Can you access health care? Is it, is it, do you have insurance? Do you not have insurance? If you have insurance, is an insurance that actually will pay for things and you're not in debt paying for medical bills. And your education system is key. Your education system, the schools, and the uh, ability to access um, community college to post-secondary, to your high schools, to your elementary schools, these are all social determinants of health. What we look at is that we actually look at health disparities, differences in health conditions, to really start to see where maybe groups are impacted. So with race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, gender, disability status, geographic location, we will see that in the United States, some groups are disproportionately impacted with health disparities. And this is where prevalence and incidence rates show us that a community is suffering more than another community. And this, the, one of the big things is that we say with health disparities, what are the social determinants of health this, that maybe are keeping people from accessing health care or creating health disparities? And we look at structural inequities and biases like transportation, education, employment, healthcare systems. Are there things that are not in place that are causing these health disparities? We look at this as a health inequity framework. Health inequity framework means that in, in public health, we used to always go downstream and look at mortality rates. And we'd say, oh, these people need to change their behaviors. But we're looking upstream now to say, hey, maybe there's some biases, there's some institutional inequities, there are living conditions, and that these social biases and inequities cause these poor living conditions that cause the risk behaviors and disease injury. And this is the framework that we're going to be using over and over in public health. You will see this framework where we're addressing health inequities. And key to this are policy. Do you see the orange? Policies are key in creating health equity. So let's take a case study here. Let's look at life expectancies in Oregon. And life expectancies is definitely a health disparity. Someone dying at a different rate than another is definitely a health disparity. And when we look at, um, at these different areas, um, we can see that um, dark blue is higher life expectancy compared to the light green, which is a lower life expectancy. And look at the difference, 81 compared to 
66. That is a, a definite gap. And that shows a health disparity within Oregon. All right, so in review, levels of prevention. There are three big ones that we're going to be talking about. Primary prevention, this is before things even happen. Safety belts laws are a perfect example. Vaccinations is another example. Secondary prevention is a screening. So this means that it's catching something preclinical. And an example of that is a mammogram, pap smear, um, any type of screening for cancer. Uh, this is an example of trying to catch thing, something before it starts to develop. Uh, and that is definitely secondary prevention. And tertiary is really uh, rehabbing and re uh, getting someone back to um, functioning. An example of this would be someone who's diabetic who had to go to the hospital and um, to get their blood sugars levels under control or um, if someone who got into a severe accident or cr a crash and uh, went to the hospital and now is in rehab to be able to walk again. The emergency response system definitely goes into tertiary prevention. That These are the different levels of prevention. And in public health, we are constantly trying to figure out how we can develop policies and educate people to really get um, the majority of the focus in primary prevention. Last but not least, in your module, I put this uh, quiz in there, um, and it's an open education resource. And if you take it, it's a little game to test your knowledge of prevention levels. So definitely check that out. Okay, that's it.